Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of Awesome Albums with your host, Awesome Andrew. Let's take a trip back to 1973 when one of the most iconic album covers ever was released. I'm of course talking about Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. If you've never seen this album before, you've been probably living on the light side of the moon. Pink Floyd consists of Roger Waters on bass, you got David Gilmour on guitar, you got Richard Wright on keyboards, and then you miss it on drums. Originally this album was going to be called Eclipse because Dark Side of the Moon was already taken by a band called Medicine Head. However, the sales for that album didn't go over too well, so Pink Floyd decided to change the name from Eclipse back to Dark Side of the Moon. And so, if you've probably heard of Dark Side of the Moon, you're probably not thinking of Medicine Head. Again, you're thinking of this. The front cover with the prism is arguably the most recognizable album cover of all time. But what does it mean? Why did they go with this design? Well, let's talk about that. The design came from their assistant, George Hardy, and a bunch of different designs were made, but the band liked the prism design the best because it represented three important elements of the band itself. For one, it represented the stage lighting, because they were known for their light shows. It also represented some of the album lyrics on the album, as well as uh, possibly any color you like. You know, get it? All the colors of the prism and any color you like. And it also followed Richard Wright's request of bold and simple. This is one of those albums that opens up, and this is known as a gatefold. Some albums have this, and others don't. And what you see here is pretty obvious. You have the lyrics, you have the credits to the band, but also notice what else is here. It looks like a heart monitor. Well, that's because it is. This is a visual representation of the first heartbeat on the first song of the album, called Speak to Me. Now speaking of speaking to me, let's speak about Speak to Me. This is one of the few songs actually credited to Nick Mason, although Roger Waters regrets giving him that credit when he left the band. This is the heartbeat that I was talking about in the gatefold, and we'll also be hearing that sound again later. Hear that ticking? We're going to hear that again too in the song Time. And that laughing? Basically brain damage. That cash register sound is from the song Money. And the helicopter noise we will hear again in the song On the Run. We are in Breathe. This is the second track on the album. Although a lot of times on the radio, you'll often hear Speak to Me and Breathe together as one song because they flow together. This song was written by Gil David Gilmour, Roger Waters, and Richard Wright, and is done by Gilmour. Gilmour is the one that's singing. And the slide guitar is also done by Gilmour. He bought this slide guitar from a pawn shop in Seattle back in 1969. And this is Gilmore singing here. The song represents birth from a relief from labor. The lyrics were composed by Roger Waters to make the listeners pause and take notice to more meaningful pursuits in life. The inspiration from the song was from another song that Waters wrote for a biology film called The Body. And the opening lyrics are the same in both songs. Although the original song was a protest of man's destruction of nature for profit. And we'll see that quite a few more times in some of Waters' work. And now we have entered the third track on the run. This was created by feeding an eight note sequence into the EMS VCS3 synthesizer and speeding up to 180 beats per minute. The song is about the pressure of traveling, which, according to Wright, would also lead the fear of death, something that we'll also talk about later in this album in the song Great Kick in the Sky. This synthesizer part was used to make it sound like a vehicle passing you, and this is known as a Doppler effect. In fact, the 
song was originally going to be called The Travel Sequence. And you can hear parts of this song that eventually evolved into the song on the run. Now, I personally like this version better than the final product, but the band liked the final product better. Now, let's cue the explosion. This sounds like a plane crash, which I guess that could be why some people are afraid of traveling. And now, with that, we have entered the fourth track, or the third track again, if you combined Speak to Me and Breathe together, and we're in the song called Time. Interesting thing about these clocks, they were actually recorded by engineer Alan Parsons for a quadraphonic test, and the sounds weren't originally going to be on the album. All these clocks were recorded from an antique store. The clocks are followed by a two-minute eerie passage with a drum beat that sort of sounds like ticking, maybe? And you also have the epic bass in there, too. This song was written by all four members, but sang by Gilmore and Wright. We had Gilmore singing the leads, and we had Wright singing leads on the bridges. The lyrics of the song deal with Roger Waters' realization that life wasn't about preparing for what happens next, but grabbing control of your destiny. Now this track here is often combined with time, but I'll go ahead and separate it as its own song. This is known as the Breathe Reprise. It uses the same melody, but it has slightly different lyrics, and it naturally also ends differently. Instead of, instead of leading into On The Run, the last note just reverberates for a second or two as we transition into the fifth song on the album known as A Great Gig in the Sky. And now we have Great Gig in the Sky, which I've mentioned a couple times earlier in the album. The song was originally going to be called The Mortality Sequence. And the song was written by Richard Wright and singer Claire Torrey. Claire Torrey was actually suggested to the band by their engineer Alan Parsons. This is Claire Torrey singing now. Originally, there were going to be lyrics, but the band decided that they didn't want to use lyrics in this, so they decided to have her improvise, and originally, she didn't even know the song was about death. She apologized for, for her performance. She didn't think it turned out that well, but the band was just in awe on how good she did. And later on in an interview, she even stated that she wasn't sure that the track would be on the final version of the album until she actually went into a record store picked up the album, saw her name in the credits, and decided to buy it. And this concludes Side 1 of Dark Side of the Moon. Remember this from Speak to Me? The cash register? Well, unlike time, these cash register sounds actually were made for this song. And as you heard from the lyrics, the song's called Money. The song was written by Roger Waters, and sang by Gilmore. An interesting thing about this song is that the tempo keeps changing. First in 7 eighths, then goes to 4 or 4, then back to 7 eighths, and then ending in 4 4. Chances are that the change in the tempo was to help Gilmore. Gilmore suggested this change, possibly for the guitar solo, to make things a little bit easier for him. We have transitioned to the song Us and Them. It was written by Wright and Waters, but sang by Wright and Gilmore, and they sang this song together in harmony. The song was written back in 1968, and it was originally an instrumental piece that was going to be played during Michelangelo Antonioni's Zambrisky Point film. The song was going to be played during a riot, and it was going to be known as the Violent Sequence. However, the song was rejected because it was too sad. The song talks about a few different things, including society's tendency of ethnocentrism and isolation in cases of war, politics, and class. The song also talks about the citizens' desires and the government. Now, some people also believe that the song was influenced by Roger Waters' father's death during World War II. We are now in the song Any Color You Like. This is the only song during the Waters-led era in which 
he does not get any of the credit, but the other three guys do. Notice how the synthesizer solo led into a guitar solo so seamlessly. In fact, Gilmore used two guitars for harmonizing guitar solo. The song is known by some as Breathe Second Reprise because it shares the same beat as the song Breathe. Although I personally think Great Geek in the Sky sounded more like a, a reprise for Breathe because I, I thought they sounded more similar. This song, as you probably gathered, is an instrumental track. And not only is it the last instrumental track on the album, it's also the last instrumental track that you'll hear on a Pink Floyd album until a momentary lapse reason in 1987. Fun fact. The song has been speculated to tie the concept by concerning the lack of choice in society while being alluded to thinking that he does have a choice. The song also talks about the fear of people making choices. You know, we've transitioned into brain damage. This song, Brain Damage, and the next song, Eclipse, are the only songs on the album that are solely written and sung by Roger Waters. He was encouraged by David Gilmour to sing this song, and after that, he became a very prominent member in terms of singing for the next 10 years, including the final cut, which is essentially a Roger Waters solo album. The song was actually written back in 1971 during the release of their album, Metal, and it was going to be called The Dark Side of the Moon, and it mentions Dark Side of the Moon several times in the song. He was road testing the song and came up with an assorted piece for lunatics, and it was recorded back in October along with the song Any Color You Like. And since they do mention Dark Side of the Moon several times in the song, some people have mistaken that to be the name of the song itself. The song is pretty self-explanatory. It's... It's about insanity and mental deterioration. But more specifically, it is about ex-band member Sid Barrett's mental deterioration. In fact, there are quite a few references to the song that talk about that, including... I'll see you on the dark side of the moon. Waters felt that this part of the song really related to Barrett's mental state. You raise the blade. You make this line refers to a frontal lobotomy, which is a surgical operation in which you make an incision in the frontal lobe to help cure mental illness. And if the band you're in starts playing different tunes. And this actually happened several times. Barrett would just randomly start playing a different song in the middle of a song that the rest of the band was playing. And this song transitioned to the final track on the album, known as Eclipse. This song is known by some to be the climax of the album, where you have all this build up, and it's just a perfect way to end this album. during this line. There is no dark side in the moon, really. Matter of fact, it's all dark. There is supposedly a Muzak version of Beatles' song, Tick the Ride, playing in the background. Now, I honestly didn't hear it, but if you guys hear it, maybe you guys can let me know. I'd like to hear what the sounds like. Now we are hearing the same heartbeat, or essentially the same heartbeat, from the first track, Speak to Me, Although not as dramatic, and notice how it starts to fade away. Although, I think you could probably loop this album and just keep playing it over and over. Eclipse, along with Brain Damage, are often played together on both the radio, and if one song makes it onto a greatest hits, the other one's going to make it on there as well, because they just go together so well. And like I mentioned earlier, since both songs mention Dark Side of the Moon multiple times in the song, it is often mistaken to be the name of the song. Well, I showed you every track on the album, as well as a few additional things that you've probably never heard before. Something else I want to point out is that this album, between then and now, has sold over 50 million copies worldwide, and that's probably like eight, 9,000 albums a week. Also, the album, after it was released, stayed number one on the charts for an entire week, which means David Gilmour won the bet against manager Steve O'Rourke, who believed that the album wouldn't even crack the top ten. 
You were wrong, Steve. Way wrong. And the album still manages to reach top 10 charts and top 200 charts and pretty much anything still even today. And people are still buying the album. So if you have not bought this 5 out of 5 album yet, I highly encourage you to do so. Because I'd hate to have anybody miss out on such a phenomenon as this. And to recap, this has been Awesome Andrew of Awesome Albums telling you why Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon is an awesome album. See you guys later.